Now, in addition to giants, a big part of the story of the Book of Enoch is that the Watchers began teaching mankind all sorts of secret knowledge, all sorts of technology and advancement. And this is something that is very hard for people to wrap their minds around. The, the idea that there was a culture that existed in the ancient time that was advanced and had technology, this is something that very few people are even willing to consider because we, are, we have it so ingrained in us that we've come from cavemen and we've advanced to where we're at today and that there was never any other time in the past of technology or advancement. However, to my Christian audience, I want to point out something real quick. And then I'm going to point out the evidence for those of you who don't see the Bible as an authority, if you're watching this and you're not a Christian, it's fine. I've got physical evidence I'm going to bring forward as well. But for my Christian audience, I want you to consider something. The book of Ecclesiastes, which Christians hold to be divinely inspired scripture, book of Ecclesiastes says this, whatever is will be again. What has happened will happen again. There is nothing new under the sun. Here's a common expression. Look, this is new. But it was already here long ago. It existed before our time. People don't remember what happened long ago, nor will there be any remembrance of what will be in the future. Even later, other people will not remember what was done before them. In these verses, Solomon is saying there is nothing new under the sun. He specifically says there's a common saying, look, this is new. This is something new that's never happened before. But he says, no, 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 it's not new. People just don't remember what happened long ago. They don't remember what happened in the past. So do you Christians who hold this to be scripture, who hold this to be divinely inspired, let me ask you a question. Do you believe this is the word of God? Because the word of God is saying there is nothing new under the sun. And the word of God is saying that many people say about whatever it is, they say, look, this is something new. But the word of God says, no, it's not new. You just don't remember what happened long ago. Think about that verse when you look at our advanced society around us today. All the technology, all of the advancement, all of the cars and the airplanes and nuclear power, all of that. Do you look at that and say, this is new. This has never happened before in man's history. Because the Bible, not just the book of Enoch, but the Bible that most Christians accept to be Bible, accept to be the word of God, this says, no, it's not new. It happened a long time ago too. But you don't remember it. Think about that. So I want to talk a bit about this ancient society that existed, that Enoch was writing about, this time when the watchers were teaching mankind advanced technology because there is a lot of evidence for it. Now, the very first thing that I think we need to address when we talk about ancient technology and all this stuff is the question that most people would ask, I used to ask this myself, is, well, if there was ancient technology, wouldn't we see like very clear things? I mean, look at look at the world around us today. Like, you know, if, if society got wiped out today, and thousands of year, years from now, people were digging up ruins, they're going to find cars and they're going to find very clear signs of technology. So, like, how can we possibly say that the ancient world had this when we look around us at the ancient world and there's no sign of it? We call it the Stone Age because all they worked with was stone. Well, that's exactly part of the problem. The reality is, when we look at the ancient past, we should not expect to see the things that we do expect to see. 
we shouldn't expect to see them because the only things that would have lasted this long are the things built with stone. In the book, Technology of the Gods, David Hatcher Childress says, one reason that we don't have many iron or other metallic objects that are tens of thousands of years old is that such an object wouldn't last that long. Most metals such as iron, copper, bronze, and tin will corrode and oxidize into nothing. An iron nail, if exposed to water, will rust and disappear in a matter of a few years. This is why gold is particularly valuable. It's indestructible. All gold that ever existed in ancient times still exists today as jewelry, coins, bullion, or whatever. Gold is too soft, however, to be used for weapons or machines, at least in its pure form. So in other words, when we look at this idea that there was ancient technology, we need to get it out of our heads that we would find power cables and cars and airplanes lying around in the desert because those things would not have lasted this long. The only things we should expect to find from an ancient advanced civilization are what they did with stone. The solution is simple. We're talking about a period of time where humans were once advanced enough to travel the world. The evidence has long since gone. When you're talking about thousands of years, and I've used this example before when it comes to the Titanic, more than 50% gone after just over 100 years underwater. And although things erode quicker underwater, when you look at cars and houses and just how fast they erode, did you know that it's theorized that if every human disappeared off planet Earth today, the longest lasting structure would be the Hoover Dam, and they estimate that it'll fall apart in about 10,000 years. We just seem to take for granted just how long of a period of time thousands and tens of thousands of years truly is. Anything that's man-made goes away, except for things made out of stone, like the pyramids or the Sphinx. And now that all the evidence shows that whoever was living in Egypt a few thousand years ago just could not have done these things. When you piece together all the things that I've outlined in this video, and you connect the dots, it's abundantly clear that the true history of ancient human civilization is far older and was far more advanced than we were taught in school. So, with that in mind, let's start looking at the evidence for advanced technology in the ancient world. In the book Serpent in the Sky, John Anthony West says, Egyptian science, medicine, mathematics, and astronomy were all of an exponentially higher order of refinement and sophistication than modern scholars will acknowledge. The whole of Egyptian civilization was based upon a complete and precise understanding of universal laws. And this profound understanding manifested itself in a consistent, coherent, and interrelated system that fused science, art, and religion into a single organic unity. In other words, it was exactly the opposite of what we find in the world today. Okay, so pausing right there real quick, he's saying, when you look at back at ancient Egypt, and ancient Egypt in the ancient world was considered to be far more advanced than anybody else. Like they were held in high esteem by everyone else because they had all this advanced knowledge. And he's saying, when you look back at what they could do and the archeological evidence, it's very clear that they had a science and a medicine and mathematics and astronomy that were all significantly of a higher order of refinement and sophistication than modern scholars will acknowledge, okay? It was way more advanced than people are acknowledging. And the whole of Egyptian civilization was based upon a complete and precise understanding of universal laws. So in other words, they were way more advanced than people are acknowledging, but then he, he, he even says that all of this, the science and art and all of their math and all of this stuff was interfused into religion, into a single organic unity. And this goes back to what we were talking about in the last video very briefly, in that in the ancient world, the temples of these pagan gods, this is where you would go for learning. They were centers of learning. This is, you know, science and math and architecture and art and all of these things were mixed in as part of their religion. Why? Because according to the book of Enoch, the watchers are the ones who taught us those things in the first place. And this brings me back to a point I made in the last video, which I want to make again very briefly here, and that is we need to recognize that the world we live in today looks eerily similar, as we're going to see throughout the rest of this video, it looks eerily similar to the ancient world prior to the flood when mankind had the teachings of the Watchers. And this should make us pause and consider the fact that our 
modern technology, knowledge, education, advancement, and all of our abilities are very similar to the world that God destroyed in the flood and therefore might not be something that we should be holding in such high esteem. These things were given to us by the watchers and learning these things and doing these things was part of pagan religion, not part of worshiping God. And that's something that we should consider and think about because our modern society is built on these things that the watchers taught us, not things that God taught us, not things that we should be searching out as a way for us to worship God. These things are part of pagan religion, and we can see that very clearly once again in this quote from John Anthony West. Anyway, continuing on, though, with this quote. So he says that they were exponentially more advanced than modern scholars will acknowledge. And then he says, Moreover, every aspect of Egyptian knowledge seems to have been complete at the very beginning. The sciences, artistic and architectural techniques, and hieroglyphic system show virtually no signs of a period of development. Indeed, many of the achievements of the earliest dynasties were never surpassed or even equaled later on. This astonishing fact is readily admitted by Orthodox Egyptologists, but the magnitude of the mystery it poses is skillfully understated, while its many implications go unmentioned. How does a civilization spring full-blown into being? Look at a 1905 automobile and compare it to a modern one. There's no mistaking the process of development, but in Egypt, there are no parallels. Everything is right there at the start. So he's saying that when we look at the ancient Egyptian world, they were of an exponentially higher degree of advancement than we give them credit for, and yet it appears that they gained that advancement all at once. Okay, he gives the analogy of looking at cars. If you look at 1905 compared to today, you can see that you know we started very basic and we learned over time how to do things better and better and better. But when we look back in the archeological record of Egypt, we don't see development. We see that all of a sudden they knew how to do these things. How? And he says, this is readily admitted by Egyptologists. And yet the magnitude of this mystery is skillfully understated while its many implications go unmentioned. What are those implications? Well, those implications are that that knowledge came from somewhere. The Egyptians were of an exponentially higher degree of advancement than anyone gives them credit for, and it happened overnight. Where did that come from? The Book of Enoch tells us where it came from. The Watchers came to Earth and taught mankind secret knowledge. So let's start looking at some of this evidence for advanced technology in the ancient world. In the book Technology of the Gods by David Hatcher Childress, he says... William Corliss reports in his Science Frontiers newsletter that the ancient Egyptians not only had advanced toilets and bathrooms, but also applied cosmetics copiously to themselves. Upper-class women, as well as many men, favored green, white, and black makeup. These cosmetic powders dating from 2000 BC have been exceptionally well-preserved in their original files made of alabaster, wood, or ceramic. I'll just pause here and say one of the things the Book of Enoch specifically says is that the Watchers taught cosmetics. They taught makeup. They taught the beautifying of yourself. Okay, and it continues. A team of French chemists led by P. Walter was not surprised when their analyses of these powders found crushed galena and kerucite, two ores of lead, However, they nearly dropped their test tubes when they also found chemical compounds that are extremely rare in nature, specifically laurionite and phosgenite. In fact, these compounds are so rare naturally that the Egyptian powders must be artificial. P. Walter wrote, Taken together, these results indicate that laurionite and phosgenite must have been synthesized in ancient Egypt using wet chemistry. The Egyptians manufactured artificial lead-based compounds and added them to the cosmetic product. So there's evidence they're finding that the Egyptians were doing chemistry, like advanced chemistry. They were manufacturing artificial compounds. That's something that 
mankind supposedly has only learned how to do in very, very recent years. Let's look at some more evidence. He continues later in the book. In 1959, communist Chinese archaeologists claimed that they had discovered ancient Chinese belt buckles in a tomb. They were several thousand years old, the newspaper account said, but, incredibly, they were made of aluminum. Aluminum is a curious metal because the smelting process from bauxite requires electricity. Aluminum is the most abundant metal on the planet, but requires electricity to create metal in a usable form. Indeed, the invention of aluminum extraction is of incalculable benefit to mankind, providing us the advanced metallurgy science that is necessary for inventions such as flight and space travel. Once again, metallurgy, something specifically mentioned in the Book of Enoch as being taught by the Watchers. The belt buckles discovered by the Chinese in 1959 make us wonder. Were these artifacts made using electricity? The aluminum smelting process from bauxite requires electricity. French scientists studied the buckles and published their studies in 1961. They concluded that the ancient Chinese were making aluminum by an unknown process. So here we've got evidence found thousands of years old. They're finding aluminum belt buckles and aluminum requires electricity to make. It's the only way we know how to make it. So either they knew something we don't know, which is by itself a crazy thought to have, or they had electricity, which is also a crazy thought to have. Neither of this fits the narrative we're taught in school. Let's keep going. The ancient Mahabharata speaks of a Vimana, an airship, as an aerial chariot with the sides of iron and clad with wings. The Ramayana describes a Vimana as a double-deck, circular, cylindrical aircraft with portholes and a dome. It flew with the, quote, speed of the wind and gave forth a, quote, melodious sound. Ancient Indian texts on Vimanas are so numerous, it would take at least one entire book to relate what they have to say. See, among others, Vimana aircraft of ancient India and Atlantis. The ancient Indians themselves wrote entire flight manuals on the care and control of various types of Vimanas. The Samara Sutra Dhara is a scientific treatise dealing with every possible facet of air travel in a Vimana. There are 230 stanzas dealing with construction, takeoff, cruising for thousands of miles, normal and forced landings, and even possible collisions with birds. Would these texts exist, they do, without there being something to actually write about? The Vemanika Sastra dealt with the operation of ancient Vimanas and included information on steering, precautions for long flights, protection of the airships from storms and lightning, and how to switch the drive to solar energy or some other free energy source. Vimanas were said to take off vertically and were capable of hovering in the sky like a modern helicopter. The ancient Indian epics go into considerable detail about aerial warfare over 10,000 years ago. So much detail that a famous Oxford professor included a chapter on the subject in a book on ancient warfare. According to Sanskrit scholar Ramachandra Dikshitar, the Oxford professor who wrote War in Ancient India in 1944, no question can be more interesting in the present circumstances of the world than India's contribution to the science of aeronautics. There are numerous illustrations in our vast Puranic and epic literature to show how well and wonderfully the ancient Indians conquered the air. To glibly characterize everything found in this literature as imaginary and summarily dismiss it as unreal has been the practice of both Western and Eastern scholars until very recently. The very idea, indeed, was ridiculed and people went so far as to assert that it was physically impossible for man to use flying machines. But today, what with balloons, airplanes, and other flying machines, a great change has come over our ideas on the subject. So pausing right there, in other words, he's saying, for many, many years, people laughed at the idea that the ancient Indians could fly because they thought it was impossible to fly. And yet now we know it is possible to fly and people are still dismissing these ancient ideas. 
He continues, commenting on the famous Vimana text, the Vimanika Shastra, he says, in the recently published Samaranga Sutradhara of Boja, a whole chapter of about 230 stanzas is devoted to the principles of construction underlying the various flying machines and other engines used for military and other purposes. The various advantages of using machines, especially flying ones, are given elaborately. Special mention is made of their attacking visible as well as invisible objects, of their use at one's will and pleasure, of their uninterrupted movements, of their strength and durability. In short, of their capability to do in the air all that is done on the earth. So in other words, there is an abundance of evidence pointing to advanced technology in the ancient world. Just like Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun. Okay, today in our advanced world with airplanes flying around, this is not new. The Bible says, you know, people will say something is new, but really it's just that they don't remember what happened long ago. And today we've got airplanes and we say this is new. We should understand the Bible is saying, no, it's not new. You just don't remember what happened long ago. But when we look at these ancient Indian texts, we've got these ancient texts that are describing airplanes, essentially, these flying machines, and they're not just talking about it in some sort of fanciful, mythical way. No, they've got like operational manuals about how to fly them, how to take off, how to land, how to steer, how to fly it in different weather, how to avoid damage with birds, and on and on and on and on and on. Very detailed documents. Why would these documents exist if there was nothing to write about? Suspend your disbelief for a bit. Because this goes against everything we've been taught our entire lives. This is so fanciful for us to consider that we it's very easy for us to dismiss it as fiction. But the fact is, this evidence exists. The Bible says there is nothing new under the sun. So we should expect that anything we see today has happened before. And the Book of Enoch tells us that watchers, angelic beings, came from heaven and taught mankind advanced secrets. So why would we not expect to see these things. Now, in addition to all these texts and these small finds like aluminum and stuff like that, there is something very glaring. This, this elephant in the room that we need to address that clearly we can see all over the world this very clear evidence of some advanced civilization that existed worldwide. Because there is this elephant in the room that shows us that there was a civilization that existed that could do things that we today cannot do. Let's read about it. David Hatcher Childress continues in one of his chapters. One of the most astonishing ancient ruins in the world is the megalithic base of Baalbek, the pre-Roman ruins upon which a Roman era temple sits. One part of the enclosure wall called the Trilithon is composed of three blocks of hewn stone that are the largest stone blocks ever used in construction on this planet, so far as is known. Underwater ruins may reveal larger constructions. This is an engineering feat that has never been equaled in history. The weight and even size of the stones is open to controversy. According to the author Rene Norbergen in his fascinating book, Secrets of the Lost Races, the individual stones are 82 feet long and 15 feet thick and are estimated to weigh between 1,200 and 1,500 tons each. A ton is 2,000 pounds, which would make the blocks weigh an estimated 2,400,000 to 3 million pounds each. While Nürburgring's size may be incorrect, his weight is probably closer to the truth. Even conservative estimates say that the stones weigh at least 750 tons each, which would be one and a half million pounds. It is an amazing feat of construction, for the blocks have been raised more than 20 feet in order to lie on top of smaller blocks. The colossal stones are fitted together perfectly, and not even a knife blade can be fitted between them. Norbergen is correct in saying that there is no crane in the world that could lift any of these stones, no matter what their actual weight is. 
The largest cranes in the world are stationary cranes constructed at dams to lift huge concrete blocks into place. They can typically lift weights up to several hundred tons. 1,000 tons, and God forbid, 2,000 tons, are far beyond their capacity. How these blocks were moved and raised into position is beyond the comprehension of engineers. There is not a contractor today that would attempt to move or lift these stones. It is simply beyond our modern machine technology. If they had cut the stones into, say, a hundred pieces, they would still be of unusually large size, larger than a man, but at least could have been stacked into a wall much more easily. One is left with the unsettling thought that the reason they used these huge stones was because they could use them and do it relatively easily. Though today, we have no idea how. So there are these stones at Baalbek. This, this location, Baalbek, is a place, it's mentioned in the Bible. It was a location that worshipped the god Baal. These stones exist there that weigh far more than we are capable of lifting today. And yet, these stones were lifted at least 20 feet up in the air and placed on top of other stones. We couldn't lift these stones one inch off the ground today with all of our machine technology. Someone in the ancient past did it. Baalbek is the clearest example of where this sort of thing has happened, but these huge stones are found all over the world. They're called megalithic ruins. They're found everywhere. And in all of these places, there are stones that are just simply too big for us today with machines and technology and all of our engines and everything we know how to do today. These stones are too big for us to move. And yet someone thousands of years ago not only moved them, but raised them up 20 plus feet in the air and set them on top of other stones. That tells us right there, something happened in our ancient past that we are not being taught because we cannot do today what the ancient people did. And we have technology. So what did they have? In addition to this, these megalithic ruins all over the world also show us that there was a worldwide civilization, okay? Because we're finding the same building techniques used all over the world, in Mesopotamia, in South America, in Central America, in Japan, all over the world, we're finding the exact same building techniques used. And those are also building techniques that we don't know how to do today. One last quote from David Hatcher Childress. He says, Throughout the world, there exists a type of megalithic construction that is called Atlantean by those researchers who believe in advanced civilizations of the past. This is typically a type of construction which used gigantic blocks of stone, often crystalline granite. Huge blocks are fitted together without mortar in a polygonal style which tends to interlock the heavy blocks in a jigsaw fashion. These interlocked polygonal walls resist earthquake damage by moving with the shock of the quake. Such Atlantean-style construction can be found all over the world. Where then is Atlantis? Atlantis is all around us, asserted British scholar John Michel in his book, The View Over Atlantis. Michel further showed that amazing ancient ruins are a worldwide phenomenon in his megalithomania. Many authors have attempted to show how the worldwide distribution of megaliths points to an advanced civilization in an antediluvian sense, including such scholarly works as Megaliths and Masterminds by Peter Lancaster Brown. Their thesis was that the ancient world was remarkably advanced for its so-called Stone Age inheritance, and they argued that an advanced civilization called Atlantis preceded the dawn of history. The prehistoric civilization not only ranged worldwide, but built impressive monuments and buildings as well. Once again, this points back to what we talked about earlier in this video, where when we look at the ancient world, a lot of times it's easy for us to say, well, where's the sign of this advanced technology? Because we're thinking power cables and cars and stuff like that. But we need to remember that 
anything made by man is going to disappear over time, especially things made out of metal. If there was an advanced civilization, the only things we should expect to see today are the stone ruins. And yes, all over the world we have stone ruins, and those stone ruins, like at Baalbek and these other places, those stone ruins were built in such a way that we don't know how they did it. We can't duplicate it today. It was, it's beyond our ability today. Meaning whatever technology they had that has since been lost to the ages of time, the things that couldn't have lasted this long, whatever they had allowed them to do with stone things that we cannot do today with stone. And we see this all over the place. He's referencing here the idea of Atlantis. We've all heard of Atlantis. We've all been told like Atlantis was this fictional thing that Plato wrote about. Do we, do you guys understand that Plato wrote a lot of stuff, but when he came to Atlantis, it's like the only time he actually bothered to say, this is a true story. This is not fiction. He said that <laughs> he, he got to Atlantis he, and everybody treats it today as if he was obviously writing fiction right here. No, he says, then listen, Socrates, to a tale which, though strange, is certainly true. So Plato, who wrote a lot of stuff, goes out of his way to say about this story, though this is a strange story, it is certainly true. And here we can see that these ruins found all over the world indicate that there was an advanced civilization prior to the flood. And the story of Atlantis is that they were an advanced civilization that disappeared underwater. Plato specifically said that the founders of Atlantis were half God and half human. That is what the ancient people saw the giants as, the children of the Watchers. The Watchers were their gods, and their children were half God and half human. The Book of Enoch tells us the Watchers had children with men who were half Watcher, half human. They had an advanced civilization. The Watchers taught them all of this advanced stuff. They fought a bunch of wars, and ultimately a flood came that wiped out everyone on Earth. This is the story of Atlantis. And yet we are dismissing it today as pure fiction and fanciful when it's one of the only things that Plato, maybe the only thing that Plato went out of his way to say, this is, though strange, it is a true story. And we can see evidence of this civilization all over the world. What I'm about to show you will likely blow your mind because by the end of this video, you will have seen overwhelming evidence that a mysteriously long-lost ancient human civilization once spanned virtually our entire planet. And the implications of that are incredible, because it means that what we were taught in school, and is still being taught and written about in the textbooks, is like really off from what actually occurred in our human history. Which is both amazing and exciting when you think about it. Now I'm about to show you more than 250 amazing photos and comparisons of ancient sites from around the world, which none of them seen by themselves prove a widespread global civilization. But when brought together and in comparison of other ancient sites that are oceans apart, it becomes nothing short of actual proof that there really was an ancient global civilization that spanned virtually every continent around the world. And you'll be left with the awkward question, which is, how was I not aware of these details before? Why is nobody in the scientific or academic community talking about this and bringing this information to light? Like, shouldn't this be in the news or something? Because none of what you're about to see is a secret. It's been right in the open for thousands and thousands of years, which is partly what makes it so mind-blowing. The widespread global extent of these similarities are what made my jaw drop, and I'm willing to bet that you'll never see these ancient sites the same way ever again. Perhaps one of the first things that comes to mind when we hear the word ancient ruins are the pyramids, yet many people are not aware that pyramids have been found throughout five continents around the world. But let's take a second to compare the unique similarities between the Steppe Pyramids of Egypt, the Steppe Pyramids of Central America, and the Steppe Pyramids of Southeast Asia. These pyramid similarities are not a main supporting argument for this video, but rather a start point. But I have to say that I do not think that these similarities are just a coincidence, especially when you consider them from a side-by-side -side comparison. Look and think for yourself. Here's what I would argue, that although in today's world we are separated by oceans and continents, we are still a global civilization that is absolutely connected. 
regardless of country borders and different governments, and in any corner of the earth, in any major city, you will find skyscrapers. And although they're all different from each other, they're still the same exact structural concept, made of steel, concrete, and glass. Different in architecture, yes, but essentially the same nonetheless. In fact, the very first skyscraper started somewhere, which happens to be in Chicago. From there, the concept spread across the world. It is my opinion that the same thing likely happened with the pyramids. And when you see what else I have to share with you in this video, you'll understand why. And like I mentioned a few moments ago, pyramids are found across five continents around the world. And one place that I know most people never knew of is Greece. Look at this here. And although much smaller compared to other pyramids around the world, it is undoubtedly very old and yet very sophisticated. Something else that you may not be aware of involving ancient Greece is that they have polygonal stone walls a couple different places around the country. They've survived thousands of years and some of the worst earthquakes in human history. When we typically think of or hear of ancient polygonal stone walls, the ruins of South America in the country of Peru likely come to mind, which I'll be discussing more of in a moment, but just like the little known stone walls in certain places in Greece, there are also a few examples in Italy as well. It's also worth mentioning that there are incredible and massive polygonal stone walls in various places in Turkey as well. Take a look at these and again be reminded of the massive stone walls in Peru. Definitely not exactly the same, but the concept sure is. And it's unbelievably difficult of an undertaking to accomplish. We have to ask ourselves why we find something so strikingly similar all the way over in Peru. Not only that, we find similar examples within ancient Egypt as well. This raises questions because as far as we were taught, there can be no possible connection between the ancient cultures of South America and Egypt, or to that of Greece and Italy. However, what I'm about to show you next may take you by surprise, as there are several examples of incredible ancient polygonal stone walls all the way over in the island country of Japan. There are a variety of different examples of them, and I'm only showing you a few here in this video. But compared to the stone walls of South America, which, although is not exactly the same, they will remind you of my skyscraper analogy I gave moments ago. Is this really just a coincidence, or a simple matter of organic human ingenuity within different civilizations that are worlds apart? Well, if that's what you think, wait until what you see next. This is a stone box sarcophagus found in ancient Japan. Now, compare it to a notable stone sarcophagus that made headlines around the world in 2018 upon its discovery, with the whole world waiting in anticipation for it to be opened so we could see what's inside. Look at the design of the stone lid, and now compare to the stone lid found in Japan, both having somewhat of a triangular shape, although not exactly the same. However, now compare the Japanese stone lid to others that are found in ancient Egypt. Wow. This is beyond similar. Look at this and think for yourself. I do not see a coincidence here. I see a connection. An ancient connection that's not supposed to be possible at all. I mean, we're talking Egypt and Japan. Worlds apart, especially in ancient times, and of course, according to the textbooks, there is no connection at all. Now, remember the Japanese polygonal stone walls I just shared with you, and let's head all the way to the complete opposite side of the Pacific Ocean to remote Easter Island, which is more than 2,000 miles from the nearest point of South America. Of course, you know, when we think of Easter Island, the notable Moai statues are probably the first thing to come to mind. Many people are surprised when they learn just how massive many of them actually are once they've been dug up and excavated. Just look at that. However, what most of you are likely to find even more surprising is to learn that there is an example of a polygonal stone wall on this island. Take a look at the details of this wall. I myself did not know this existed until creating this video, as it's the Moai statues that get all the attention. Now, compare this wall to a wall all the way over in Peru. Look at these comparisons and tell me that this isn't a total match. The side-by-side -side comparisons definitely make my eyebrow go up because the consensus of academic scholars is that there is no connection between Easter Island and Peru. Transoceanic sea travel during this time frame 
was considered to be impossible, and again, to suggest it, is fringe and pseudo-archaeological, like I stated earlier. So, how do we explain the unbelievably similar comparison to the little-known cloud people statues of Peru? Tell me this isn't unbelievably similar, and again, created at a time when travel between Peru and Easter was not considered a possibility. But that's not all. Compare these statues to others as far away as Turkey and, get this, Indonesia. Although not exactly the same, when you look at the more nuanced details such as hand positions and unique facial and jaw structure, I mean, come on, is this also just a coincidence? Now, he goes on here for a little while with tons and tons of different pieces of evidence all around the world that shows that there was one civilization that spanned the entire world. And he goes on here for quite a while. I don't have time to play the entire video here, so you can go check out this video for yourself. But I'm going to skip ahead now to his conclusion at the end of this video. All of this could be just a coincidence and inconsequential when you look at it by itself. But when you bring it all together, it, does this not amount to actual proof that clearly there is far more going on in our ancient past than what we ever thought? I mean, let's review real quick. We have gold funerary masks among three separate and far apart cultures that are supposed to have no connection to each other at all. We have depictions of cobra snakes at the head of two different cultures, along with depictions of the caduceus among three different cultures, along with depictions of the tridents among those cultures, depictions of handbags etched in stone, separated by, in some cases, tens of thousands of years when you consider Gobekli Tepe to the connection of the Olmecs in Mesoamerica. I mean, really, is that detail just a coincidence? How specific can we get? We also have the creepy similarity of the Moai statues to others in Peru, Turkey, and Indonesia. We also have a bizarre similarity between Egypt and Japan when you consider that stone box sarcophagus and how similar they both look and having had no connections between those two cultures that were a world apart. We also have polygonal stone blocks found throughout the world, ranging from Easter Island, Peru, Egypt, Japan, and throughout the Mediterranean. And we also have the stone nub phenomena that are found across the world, including again, Japan, Micronesia, Indonesia, Egypt, Peru, and again, throughout Africa and Europe. Consider all of that, and now take a second look at the similarities between the pyramids of Egypt, Cambodia, and Central America. Do these side-by-side -side comparisons really suggest a simple and natural evolution of structural design that are totally organic and natural within itself? Or is it when you study the specific and truly unique aspects and in combination with everything else shared in this video, does it seem to be more than just a coincidence? Academics profusely reject an ancient global connection or civilization of any kind, and they ridicule others that suggest it with essentially name-calling, you know, words like fringe and pseudo. Yet, they never actually go through and share all of the details with those who they intend to persuade. Look at all these details that I've shared in this video and think for yourself. And isn't it interesting that none of these things were shared with you in school at all? In fact, only a very small percentage of people have seen some of these details before. And once again, I want to come back to the Egyptians because the Egyptians were seen as the epitome of advancement in the ancient world. And even Plato, when he talks about Atlantis, he says he got the story from Solon who got the story from the Egyptians. So the Egyptians were highly revered in their time as being extremely advanced and having all sorts of knowledge. And I want to come back because when we look at the things that the Egyptians did, we can see things that they did that we can't do today in Egypt right there in front of us all the time in all of these ancient ruins that we have available to us in Egypt. We can see that they did things that we could not duplicate today. And we can also see that the explanations that science is giving us for how they did these things, it doesn't hold any water. So remember when we talked about Baalbek, it talked about these giant stones that we couldn't lift with our strongest, mightiest crane that we own today, that we've created today. We could not lift one of these stones. And it says that these stones were fitted together so tightly that a knife blade couldn't fit between them. That was at Baalbek. That same idea is found all over the world. All of these ruins with these polygonal structures, 
all of those have this idea that you can't fit a knife blade or anything, even a piece of paper between them. Let's look at what that's talking about in Egypt because we can see that exact same concept in Egypt and you can see how unreal that is for us to say that this was done with primitive technology. Do you remember back in school when they said that the stone blocks cut by the ancient Egyptians were so precise that you couldn't fit a razor blade or even a human hair in between them? Well, this is what they meant. Look at that. The precision cut of these massive and extremely hard granite blocks is so unbelievably exact that it's difficult to even differentiate the two stones together. The high definition camera itself, despite all its megapixels, struggles to pick up this line. It's something that can only be truly appreciated when viewed in person with the naked eye. And if you think this is impressive, wait until you see the photos from other parts of ancient Egypt that I'm going to show you later in this video. But what you're seeing here are the enormous polygonal stone blocks that make up the Valley Temple, which is located in front of the Great Sphinx in Giza, Egypt. This is one of those sites that most people are unaware of as the Great Sphinx and the pyramids get all the attention, but it is without a doubt one of the most spectacular sites found from ancient Egypt. Many of these rose granite blocks are well over 30 tons apiece. However, the immense difficulty to construct a temple made out of polygonal shaped granite pieced together as if a tight-fitted puzzle is next level difficulty made to last millennia and survive even the strongest of earthquakes. And when I said that these stones are massive, you have to compare them to people to truly appreciate their size. And that's me there, I'm 5 foot 10 or 178 centimeters. Even with this photo, you can't truly appreciate it as this was shot with an ultra wide camera lens, which distorts the true size and the bulk of these blocks, particularly their widths. It does not do it justice for what your eyes witness here in person. And, and by the way, this particular block is closer to 50 tons in weight and brought from more than 500 miles away, which the experts theorize must have been carried by boat down the Nile River. However, the bizarre reality is that even the largest known ancient Egyptian boat ever found couldn't possibly sustain even a fraction of the weight of these stones. Make no mistake, the mystery is real, hence why there is a surging interest by millions of people from around the world into our lost ancient past. But that aside, and going back to the unbelievable precision that makes up these stones, notice that from a distance you can't possibly appreciate just how tightly cut and formed together they are. You see, many of these blocks are cut with rounded edges, thus creating a seam or groove of sorts between the blocks. But when you get up close, you can see that in the middle of these seams is a cut so perfect that they are completely flushed together as if they were laser cut. In fact, they almost look fused together. And you'll find awesome examples all throughout this magnificent structure. Take this example here. From a bit of a distance, you wouldn't realize just how exact the cut is, again due to the breadth of the seams. Virtually all the blocks that make up this astounding stone complex are like this. It's simply fascinating. From a distance, you wouldn't think much of the methods used to cut these stones, but it's not until you get up close that you can appreciate the level of accuracy. It truly is next level. But you should know that this is not some one-off fluke example, as there are countless others found throughout the land of ancient Egypt. Even the ground itself has been lined with such unbelievably precise stone blocks that without careful inspection, you might not notice at all, and like I just said, Stone cuts that are so fine that it's difficult for even cameras to pick up on. Just compare this line cut to a hotel room key, which is of course the size of a credit card. The exactness of these two blocks that are pieced together makes the width of that card look thick in comparison. Because again, notice how you can hardly see that line from even just a few feet above it. And you'll be curious to know that this example here is only a few steps away from the Great Pyramid of Giza. In fact, it's right next to it. You see, something that most people are not aware of is that the entire ground surrounding the pyramids are covered in flooring stones, and there are thousands of them, many of which are polygonal in shape, cut and pieced together perfectly, again, as if a puzzle. You see, it becomes even more interesting when you realize that these stones have been there for at least 4,500 years, 
beneath the blaring sun and elements of erosion, including wind, rain, weather, and of course, millions of humans that have walked on, stumbled, and further deteriorated these blocks in the thousands of years since. And examples of polygonal flooring stones can be found at various temples throughout Egypt, even in the most unlikely places such as the roof of the Temple of Hathor in Dendera. Hundreds of polygonal stones, which, although weathered and eroded, upon a closer inspection you can see just how precise these stone cuts are. But getting back to the even more impressive stuff, wait until you see this. The so-called Bent Pyramid of Egypt is a place that very, very few people have seen with their own eyes as it's been closed to the public and even archaeologists for several decades. That is until it finally opened in the summer of 2019 and I had the great timing and privilege to be among the very first tourists to enter this utterly bizarre structure in December of 2020 and I filmed the entire thing. And if you're interested in seeing the incredibly bizarre interior structure and layout of this pyramid, you'll want to check out my video tour of it after this video. But when you enter inside and traverse the tunnels of cut limestone that makes up the structure, you see precision cuts, the likes of which are nothing short of astounding. Look at that. Like I mentioned earlier, many of these cuts are so exact that it's difficult for the camera to differentiate the blocks together. Even notice this example of three stone blocks joined. Ignore the damage and imperfect exterior portions of the stone block, which naturally catch your eye, and focus on the line cuts themselves. Whoever built this clearly chose to make the fitting of the blocks to a level of perfection while focusing less on the exterior portion of blocks that make up the pyramid tunnels. And you'll notice that this is the case from floor to ceiling throughout this pyramid, and these blocks are by no means small, yet cut so perfectly that they align so tightly that not even a razor or human hair could fit in between them. I'd even venture to say that they're probably watertight as well, and do not be fooled by their soft, chalk-like appearance. You could push your fingernail into this stone as hard as you possibly could and it wouldn't even scratch it. As the saying goes, they are as hard as a rock. In examples like this, where we see the intersection of three stone blocks connecting at such a fine degree of accuracy, provides us with a wonderful perspective that illustrates just how remarkable the capabilities were for the people that made this. That's right, and here's something else you need to know, is that out of the hundreds of thousands of hieroglyphics found throughout the land of ancient Egypt, not one single one of them shows anything about how the Egyptians cut or carved stone or constructed the pyramids. Literally zero whatsoever, and that's a verifiable fact, by the way. It's just that most people are completely surprised when they hear that for the first time. You see, what happened is we were shown animations like these as children in school, not realizing that this is nothing more than some theorized drawing created only recently for school textbooks. A bunch of primitive dudes wearing nothing but loincloths using soft bronze chisels to shape the stones that make up the pyramids of Egypt. But here is the reality of what happened when people actually tested these primitive alleged methods in modern times. After days of work, their copper chisels and stone pounders are barely making a dent. Brown is wearing down tools at an extraordinary rate. The copper chisel the ancient Egyptians would have used lasts only a few dozen strikes. That was a notable Egyptologist testing stone hammers and bronze chisels on limestone in an attempt to recreate the Sphinx's nose. And you heard what they said. After a few days of work, and they barely made a dent, and the chisels themselves, after just a few dozen strikes, were worn out and useless. So clearly not a feasible explanation. And what you didn't see is that later in this documentary, they completely gave up and resorted to using power saws to finish the task. But that was bronze chisels on limestone. Wait until you see what happened when he tried it on granite. When Roger tries chisels made from bronze, the results are disappointing. As you can see, we're just we're leaving a lot of metal and very little stone is flaking off. Yeah, so no. Obviously, bronze chisels were not the methods of tools utilized by the Egyptians or, or anyone. <laughs> to cut and carve stone of any kind. Which is why it is so bizarre to see that this is still a primary explanation that is taught today. They even have it posted as descriptions within museums, and 
The reason for this is because the people writing ancient history books in modern times have concluded that these must be the types of tools that were used since they are the only types of tools that have ever been found, so case closed, mystery solved. But they proclaim that without ever having tested these primitive, alleged methods themselves. And bronze chisels aside, the more commonly accepted explanation for cutting the granite and limestone blocks involves copper saws. But again, these are the only examples of saws ever found from the ancient Egyptians. And not only that, the only depictions of the Egyptians using saws of any kind are these right here, which clearly shows them using small saws to cut wood for constructing furniture. So watch what happens with that same Egyptologist, Mark Lehner, used a copper saw to demonstrate how it could have been used to cut granite blocks. All right, we have a big block of granite here. So how's this copper gonna cut this granite? Even with teeth, the copper alone is too soft. We're going to put sand inside the groove and we're going to put this saw on top of the sand and then let the sand do the cutting. Now, Dennis, will we see any progress in our lifetime? Yes, um, if you came back in an hour's time, you would see about a four millimeter cut down into the stone. You're kidding, in an hour you'll be four millimeters down? Well, I've been doing a lot of experiments and I can guarantee that this will cut through the stone at about four millimeters an hour. The sign went wonderful once we switched over to using uh, water with the sand. As you can see here, we achieved this in just a few days. Four millimeters an hour and just a few inches over a few days? Are you kidding me? So besides the fact that no saw of this size was ever found, nor was there any saw of this size ever found to be depicted by the Egyptians, but we can clearly see that this method is so unbelievably so or slow that it couldn't possibly be a feasible explanation for how the Egyptians cut and carved the millions of stones that make up the pyramids. Because keep in mind that the Great Pyramid of Giza is made of some 2.3 million stone blocks and was said to be constructed over approximately 20 years. That means that they would have had to cut, carve, move in place at least one stone block every few minutes to achieve that timeline. And this does not include the many millions of more stone blocks that make up more than a hundred other known pyramids found throughout Egypt. Many people are not aware of just how many Egyptian pyramids there are, and all of which were said to be done within a very specific timeline for their respective pharaoh, at least according to the alleged story that we've been taught in modern times. And I wonder just how many millions of blocks would make up that 118 pyramids, because of course they're all of differing sizes and dimensions. And this does not include the many millions of stone blocks that make up the dozens of various temples found throughout Egypt. This is just a few examples, all of which were made from countless stacked blocks. Nor does it include the countless flooring stones that surround these temples and the pyramids of Giza itself. Nor does it include the hundreds of various structures, including mastabas, all of which are made of stone blocks nor does it include the countless stones that make up the many columns found at dozens of sites throughout Egypt, nor does it include the many gigantic stone obelisks, giant stone boxes, as well as the countless stone sarcophagi found all over the place, far more than could possibly be shared in this video, and nor does it include the thousands of incredible stone statues that have been found throughout the land of ancient Egypt. And it sure doesn't include all of the other random, incredibly shaped granite stones that were once part of structures that are long since gone. Impeccably curved granite that couldn't possibly be done with the known tooling found in Egypt, is, at least as far as what you've just seen. And you don't have to be a stonemason, archaeologist, or even a frickin' rockin' scientist to comprehend that these tools here, copper saws and chisels, did not create the cuts of this level of precision and this certainly does not even address the size of these stones and the time it would take to do it, which is of course a major factor that must be considered. But there is even more proof that these blocks were not cut with two guys holding on to some handheld saw. This granite sarcophagus is one of many that are on display in the Cairo Museum in Egypt. However, what makes this particular stone box so unique is that it's listed as being discarded by the Egyptians as on the other side, you see that they made a mistake in the cut and it went off center. But this in itself is evidence that the Egyptians were not using some 
unbelievably slow, primitive handheld saw because if that was the case, they would have noticed and corrected their mistake almost immediately. The fact that it continued off center for nearly another three feet strongly indicates that they were using a method that was far quicker and superior. The evidence is right in front of us. Like I always say, look and think for yourself. There are far too many details that weren't shown to us when we learned about the Egyptians as kids. But when you revisit this amazing topic as an adult with more life experience and the ability to use discernment, you can see just how real the mystery is. Yet despite all the details I shared in this video, many will still adamantly defend these debunked narratives. But you have to keep in mind that many of these people that propose these alleged methods have never actually been to Egypt themselves, and nor have they physically tried to cut a stone block with these primitive methods either. And those who have attempted it have given up. They've never finished one single block. They do it for a little bit and realize like, oh wow, this is extremely difficult, and just stop right there. I mean, isn't that interesting? Because between all the stone cut blocks that make up the hundreds of pyramids, temples, various stone structures, flooring stones, columns, obelisks, statues, stone boxes and sarcophagi, and everything else, I wouldn't be surprised if the Egyptians cut at least 50 million stone blocks. Maybe even closer to 100 million, perhaps. I mean, who knows? Yet you will not find one single example in modern times of a fully cut stone block that was done with these primitive methods. Isn't that interesting? You have the Egyptians with tens of millions of stone blocks, maybe even 100 million, I'm just throwing out a number here, but tens of millions, no doubt. And yet we haven't done one in modern times. You need to look at this with open eyes and see that the mystery is here. When you see this stuff as an adult, you can see just how real the mystery is. Guys, the fact is this evidence, and I'm scratching the surface here. I Bright Insight is a great channel. He goes over this a ton. You can go check out his videos. These clips I've shown you are just snippets of those videos. It's not the full thing. So you can go look those up and watch the full thing. But the evidence around the world is overwhelming that backs up the story as told in the Book of Enoch. There was an advanced civilization and they could do things back then that we cannot do today. The history we are being taught is a lie. It's not the truth. It is a history that was built by modern mankind for the purpose of covering up the biblical story. They did not want to present evidence that showed that the stories of the Bible were true, that giants were real, that there was an advanced civilization, that there was a flood. They did not want these things to be shown to be true, so they created a false version of history. And they didn't even realize, when they started doing this, they didn't even realize that they were not only covering up the Bible, but actually hundreds and hundreds of civilizations all around the world told the same stories. They didn't even realize that back then, but now they know that, but they're still just trying to pile it on, cover it all up, and not let anyone realize what the evidence actually points to. There was an advanced civilization. But the final thing I want to look at in this video is the fact that the Book of Enoch says that not only was there an advanced civilization, but they fought wars with each other. Part of the punishment of the Watchers was that they would have to witness their children wipe each other out in war. And again, we're not talking about people fighting with swords and spears. Look at the evidence and understand the advanced technology that they had. And understand that they were spread out all over the world. What do you think that war looked like when they wiped each other out? Because there's actually evidence all over the world that there was an ancient, very destructive war. And as we saw in the last video, every ancient culture said there was a time when the gods all started fighting each other. And it was horrible. And it lasted for years and it was extremely destructive. And we saw a specific text from ancient India, which we're going to look at here again in just a second in this next video, that documents how destructive this war really was and how eerily it parallels things that we know about today. Let's take a look. In the early hours of the morning on July 16, 1945, at a remote location somewhere deep in the desolate New Mexico desert, the first atomic bomb was successfully detonated. This was the Trinity Test, 
the culmination of the infamous Manhattan Project started by President Franklin Roosevelt in 1942 with the goal of weaponizing nuclear energy. The test effectively ended the race between the United States, Germany, and the Soviet Union to develop just such an unstoppable weapon. A race run in hidden laboratories and isolated locales across the world since at least the 1930s, the culmination of the life's work of some of the greatest minds on Earth. A few weeks later, it would effectively end World War II when nuclear bombs were dropped on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki with horrifying consequences. For all those who bore witness to the Trinity test, it was an extraordinary life-changing sight to behold. A 40,000-foot-high mushroom cloud billowing up to the heavens. In the detonation zone, the bomb left a 300-foot crater five feet deep in the Earth. Much to the surprise of scientists and onlookers, inside of the crater, the rough New Mexico sand had been turned into a smooth sheet of shimmering green glass. This meant the bomb had produced temperatures of over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, that which is needed to melt silica sand into glass. Members of the project team, believing this radioactive glass to be a unique, brand new material found nowhere else on Earth, took the opportunity to name it Trinitite, after the Trinity test. Except, what if they had it wrong? What if Trinitite wasn't a unique material found anywhere else on Earth? Shortly after the test, one scientist had a moment of deja vu while examining the Trinitite glass. From the recesses of his mind came a memory long since suppressed of something similar he had seen in the African desert decades earlier. But wait, he quickly calculated, if an atomic bomb had created Trinitite in the New Mexico desert, then what he'd seen in Africa must have been created by something thousands of times more powerful. In 1932, Patrick Clayton and a team from the Egyptian Geological Survey were driving through the dunes of the Great Sand Sea, close to the Saad Plateau in Egypt. As they drove, Clayton began to notice a curious noise emanating from under the vehicle. Some sort of crunching sound from the tires entirely inconsistent with the usual noise made driving on sand. Stopping to examine the situation, Clayton discovered that he and his team were driving on great sheets of greenish glass buried just under the sand, the crunching noise originating as the weight of the vehicle cracked and broke the glass into chunks beneath them. Clayton and his team were puzzled. What could have caused this unusual phenomenon? A decade before the start of the Manhattan Project, they could not envision the type of force required to turn an ocean of sand into glass. The dunes of Egypt, however, are far from the only place on Earth where this so-called desert glass has been found. In southern Iraq, a layer of glass was discovered deep in the Earth during an excavation. Similar glass had also been found in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia and along the ancient Silk Road in China at a site which has become known as the Chinese Roswell, as well as in Israel, where a quarter-inch thick deposit of this glass was found spanning several hundred square feet in 1952. Most unbelievably, a monumental deposit of this desert glass covering an unbelievable 2,500 square miles has been discovered in Libya. So, what is this strange desert glass, rediscovered by accident in New Mexico, but existing all over the world, and what could have caused it? At first, scientists offered meteors as an explanation. Except, while a meteor strike may be able to melt sand into glass, it leaves fragments of iron and other minerals not found in the pure glass of Libya or elsewhere. Further, meteor glass generally takes the form of beads, rather than smooth, expansive sheets. And of course, a meteor leaves a crater, and craters were not detected, even using satellite imagery, at places this desert glass was discovered. It warrants mention that, while the Trinity test did in fact leave a crater, future uses of nuclear bombs did not, as scientists discovered that detonation above ground maximized the devastation of the weapon. There were no craters left at Hiroshima or Nagasaki. 
Some have suggested that lightning strikes might be to blame for the desert glass, but again, while it may melt sand, glass formed by lightning takes the form of a strike, burrowing into the ground like branches of coral. So if not meteors or lightning strikes, then what? What could have caused these great formations of glass, otherwise only seen at a modern nuclear test site? The director of the Trinity test, the theoretical physicist Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer, may have offered an indirect answer to this question. Seven years after New Mexico, Oppenheimer was asked by one of his students if the Trinity test was, in fact, the first atomic bomb test ever conducted. To this, he offered the cryptic reply, yes, in modern times. What did Oppenheimer mean by this statement? Was he suggesting that nuclear power had been harnessed and nuclear weapons utilized sometime in the past? In the early 1970s, France was searching for uranium in Gabon, West Africa, one of their former colonies, to fuel their nuclear power plants back home. They did manage to discover a number of uranium deposits, arranged curiously in a straight, tidy row. As if this apparent coincidence wasn't strange enough, French scientists received a real shock when they removed some of this uranium and sent it for testing. See, uranium found in the Earth's crust, in the moon, even in meteors, has a very specific level of uranium-235 content, 0.72%. Unlike the more predominant uranium-238, uranium-235 can sustain a fission chain reaction, that is, it can be used for nuclear power, as well as nuclear weapons. Yet, the uranium the French had pulled out of the ground in Gabon had significantly less uranium-235 than 0.72%. In fact, it had the makeup not of raw uranium, but of used uranium. It even contained other elements not naturally occurring at levels which aligned with the spent fuel of nuclear power plants. It was almost as if someone in the distant past had been using these uranium deposits arranged neatly in a row as they were. But if so, then who and for what? The answer to this question perhaps lies to the east in India and what is now the country of Pakistan. In 1927, ruins were unearthed during a geological excavation in Mohenjo-Daro, Pakistan, which stunned excavators and experts alike. Starting at an apparent epicenter and extending outwards for 50 yards, the ruins had been fused and crystallized. In effect, the ruins had been turned to glass around an epicenter, which seemed to indicate a blast. More bizarrely, 44 human skeletons were found lying in the street, many holding hands as if they had suddenly been struck down by some unexpected catastrophe like the Mount Vesuvius volcano eruption in Italy, except in an area devoid of volcanic activity. Upon examination, scientists wondered why these skeletons, many thousands of years old, had not decayed. When they were tested, the bones showed radiation levels many times higher than could be expected. At least one of the skeletons was recorded as having 50 times the radiation level it should have had. One scientist by the name of William Sturm concluded that the melting of bricks at Mahenjo-Daro could not have been caused by a normal fire, while Antonio Castellani, a space engineer in Rome, suggested, it's possible that what happened at Mahenjo-Daro was not a natural phenomenon. But these types of apparently unnatural phenomena have been found across the Indian subcontinent. For example, in Jodhpur, on the edge of the Tar Desert in India, a three square mile radioactive zone was discovered during excavation for a housing project. Under the ground was a layer of radioactive dust consistent with what is found in areas after a nuclear detonation. 
Sometimes evidence does not make sense, and for the experts, Mohenjo-Daro and Jodhpur seemed to be evidence which suggested the use of nuclear weapons many thousands of years or more before the Manhattan Project. Is it possible this is what Oppenheimer was referring to when he asserted the Trinity test was the first nuclear bomb in modern times? It is interesting to note that upon creating his bomb, Oppenheimer infamously said, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. This was a quote he took from the Bhagavad Gita, an ancient Indian text Oppenheimer was intimately familiar with, having learned the Sanskrit language specifically so he could read it in its original language. Consider that, within the Bhagavad Gita, there are numerous accounts of magical superweapons wielded by gods which sound, frankly, a whole lot like modern nuclear bombs. One such weapon caused crowds of warriors with steeds and elephant and weapons to be carried away as if they were dry leaves of trees, while another produced an incandescent column of smoke and flame as bright as 10,000 suns, which sounds eerily similar to the mushroom clouds produced by nuclear bombs. Perhaps the most powerful weapon was known as the Brahmastra, a single projectile charged with all the power in the universe. It was an unknown weapon, an iron thunderbolt, a gigantic messenger of death, which reduced to ashes an entire race. There was neither a counterattack nor a defense that could stop it. Some have suggested these accounts are not all that dissimilar to biblical accounts of Sodom and Gomorrah, as the Bible says in the book of Genesis, Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah, from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities, and also the vegetation in the land. Going further, Consider the description in the Bhagavad Gita of the long-term effects where these types of weapons were used. Hair and nails fell out, pottery broke without any apparent cause, and the birds turned white. After a few hours, all foodstuffs were infected. Any target hit by the Brahmastra would be utterly destroyed. Land would become barren and lifeless. Rainfall would cease and infertility in humans and animals would follow for eons of time. In many ways, this resembles the long-term effects of radiation felt by humans and the environment after the use of nuclear weapons. Incidentally, the inhabitants of Jodhpur where radioactive dust similar to what is found in a nuclear blast site was discovered have long been plagued with higher incidences of cancer, birth defects, and other health complications. What if these ancient stories for the Bhagavad Gita are not allegorical myths, but rather historical accounts of events which actually took place? Could humans have discovered the secrets of nuclear power way back in the distant past, as Oppenheimer appeared to allude to, before literally blowing themselves back to the Stone Age? Or perhaps it is something deeper, more nefarious, Perhaps these weapons were not being used by humans, but on humans. Maybe those recorded in the texts as gods were not gods at all. So I know that is a crazy concept to wrap your mind around, but as we can see, there is very strange evidence that exists of a possible nuclear war in the past. Suspend your disbelief for a moment and just look at the evidence. Because these stories were told prior to us knowing about nuclear weapons or anything. And people were seeing evidence around that they couldn't explain. And they were reading these stories and they said, well, that's obviously fanciful fiction because no one can do that. And now we live in a time where we are capable of doing those things that were written about in ancient times. And it results in the very same thing that we have been finding all over the world. These massive plains filled with vitrified sand that's been turned to glass. The amount of heat and destruction that it takes to vitrify sand into glass 
is something that we only know nuclear weapons can do that. Maybe other things can, but we only know about nuclear weapons. And we can see from all of the other evidence we've been looking at that there was there is evidence of an advanced civilization. Again, the only things we should expect to find from an ancient advanced civilization are the things that they did with stone because everything else would be gone by now. We can see from the stone that there was an advanced civilization that did things that we don't know how to do. We don't know how they did it, but we know that they did do it. And we can see this other evidence that it would appear nuclear weapons have been used on Earth in the ancient past. And some of the brightest minds like Oppenheimer, they themselves think that this is true. This is where the evidence leads. This is what the evidence points to. And all of it confirms what the Book of Enoch said. As strange of a story as it is for us to read today, as much as it sounds like fantasy and fiction, the evidence confirms what the Book of Enoch says. And this is evidence that the Book of Enoch is telling a true historical account, which is precisely why Jesus and Jude and the apostles, they all believed it. We should already believe the book of Enoch is real because they believed it and they are an authority. But in addition to that, the evidence points to it. So guys, it's time for us to pause and look at the book of Enoch and look at what it says and recognize that the evidence all points to that, even if it's not evidence that we're being taught in school. There's a reason we're not being taught it. They don't want you to understand that this is true. As Peter said, they willfully forget that these things happen. They... They are choosing to ignore the fact that these things happened. That's the time we live in. These stories are being willfully ignored and willfully forgotten. They're not being taught to us, but the evidence all points to it. And so we shouldn't just dismiss something like the Book of Enoch because it's strange, because it's weird, because it actually does fit the evidence and it fits what all of the ancient cultures were saying, as we saw in the last video. And Jesus and Jude and the apostles, they all endorsed this book as well. So I hope that this has all helped you see our history differently. Helped you understand that the history of this world is vastly different than what we're taught. It's vastly different than what even most Christians understand, coming from a creationist background. And this, along with everything we've been talking about in this series, Jesus and the apostles endorsing this book and teaching from this book, this is why we should be reading the Book of Enoch, because it explains things to us that most of us are not familiar with. And Jesus and the apostles taught from this book. And when you read this book and you really study it and you immerse yourself in it, you start to understand a lot of the things that the New Testament is teaching. You start to understand why God says certain things. You start to understand the history of this world and who the devil is, who God's enemies are. You start to understand where we're coming from and why God sees certain things as evil. And you also start to recognize how evil the world is all around us. Because the world around us today is following the watchers. 110%. And we really need to start recognizing that. We need to recognize who Satan is. Too many Christians have this idea that Satan is this horned being that we get from kind of years and years of Catholic teaching and, and man's traditions where it's this red being with horns who holds a pitchfork and people don't understand who Satan actually is and those who worship Satan and what they're trying to achieve. Satan is a Hebrew word that means enemy. It is the enemy of God and the enemy of God is the one who came and said, eat of the tree of knowledge and you will become like gods. The gods being the watchers, the gods being the ones with knowledge. Take of our knowledge and you will be like us. That is their goal. The watchers came to bring mankind advanced knowledge and create a civilization built around them being the gods. And our society today is still chasing after their knowledge, their wisdom, their technology, their advancements, all of that. It's time that we recognize that all of this is built around chasing after the tree of knowledge. And these are not things that God wants us to be 
chasing. It's not things that God wants us to be prioritizing. In fact, this knowledge and this ability, these these capabilities and this advancement, these are things that the book of Enoch says, those were actually worthless secrets that the watchers stole from heaven. There are better ones out there that God is waiting to give to those who are righteous. Let's wait for those and not hold on and chase after all of this garbage that the watchers gave us. This is not who we're supposed to be. Let's stop loving this world. Let's stop loving the things the watchers gave us. Stop trying to pursue the education and knowledge and advancement of this world. And let's do the things that Jesus told us to do. Very direct and clear commands. And we talked about that in a lot of detail in our series called Dead Church. So you can go and watch that or read the book. It's available for free. Go to our website and find it. Jesus gave us very specific commands of what it means to follow him, what it means to worship him, what it means to worship God. And we should be doing those things and not making up our own ways and not chasing after the knowledge and teachings of the watchers. Because this stuff is all real. And that's who Satan actually is. The bringer of quote-unquote knowledge. So anyway, I'm going to wrap this up here. The Book of Enoch is a book that I highly, highly recommend you go read. Because of everything we've gone over in this series. The writers of the New Testament, Jesus and the Apostles, taught from the Book of Enoch and they endorsed the Book of Enoch. And that alone should be enough for us to take it seriously and go read it. But in addition to all of that, history confirms that the story Enoch tells is a true story. So we should take it seriously, we should learn the lessons from it, and we should learn what it tells us about the world we live in today. So thanks for joining me in this series as we look at this book, and I encourage you now, go out and learn about this yourself. Learn more about these things that we've covered in the last video and this video, because again, I am only scratching the surface. This is not comprehensive. This is really just kind of barely touching on these topics, and there's a lot of evidence out there that is very fascinating to learn about because it confirms everything about the biblical story. There's a lot of evidence out there. And when you understand that these things are purposefully being covered up, but that the evidence is out there, you can go and you can find these things and you can understand why it seems like the Bible contradicts science so much. It doesn't. Science is covering up evidence. Science has turned into scientism. They teach us the scientific method and then they themselves don't follow the scientific method, but we all think they do because they taught us the scientific method. And we need to understand that that is what's happening. That's why we're not learning about these things. And we should go look into these things and learn the evidence because it helps us stand firm on what we believe because we then understand that all of the evidence in the world backs up our position. And it does not back up theirs. They've built a house of cards. And that house of cards is going to fall. Mm -hmm.